Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. Hey, guys. The B1M. The link to the original video, top of the description. Okay? Let's get started. James Bond? How Britain built its top secret MI6 headquarters. Let's go. How do you Hi, guys. A building secret. Maybe you find an undercover location hidden away from prying eyes. Or do you design some invisible building? In, the kind of place you might walk past without thinking twice. And who do you keep that building a secret from? Can you even keep it a secret from the people who built it? And can you really keep anything under wraps when it's the home of this guy? The name's Bond. Name's Bond. James Bond. Okay. I grew up with Pierce Brosnan, okay? He's James Bond to me, all right? I know he's not considered one of the best, all right? But he holds a place. The building behind me is not just the London office of the world's most famous secret agents. It's also the real-life headquarters of SIS, Britain's secret intelligence service, better known to the rest of the world by its nickname, MI6. The building is a secure, cutting-edge fortress, but its predecessors have often been the exact opposite. And the story of how the service ended up here says a lot about how it's evolved. This is how Britain built its spy headquarters. Magic. My god, this is bringing me back to the video games. The Nintendo 64 one. Also the GameCube one. With the, uh, chairlifts, gondolas. It took me so long to realize we were staring down a gun in that famous, like, and then the blood. Voxel Cross, to give the building its proper name, is a monumental edifice of espionage. Its imposing imperial design is kind of the modern face of the iconic service. But it's actually come a really long way from SIS's more humble origins. Before Vauxhall Cross, SIS stayed true to its motto of always secrets by simply hiding in plain sight. In 1909, according to the brass plaque on the exterior, this building was the office of Messrs. Raisin Falcon Limited, shippers and exporters. Only a select few were aware it was actually the headquarters of SIS founder Sir Mansfield Cumming. Cumming was a workaholic with a long legacy. He signed his name C and wrote exclusively in green ink, a tradition which continues for the head of the service to this day. He was also obsessive about secrecy. In 1919, when he moved his office to this townhouse in West London, visitors were first instructed to go to an office six kilometers away on the Strand, where they were then given the address. He even tried to keep the location from his boss, the Director of Military Intelligence. SAS continued the practice of renting commercial office space under a false name for the next few decades. But as the Cold War dawned, the limitations of that approach quickly... I think the CIA does a similar thing, um, or just military... In terms of, like, military... Companies that, like work overseas they're on a, like a completely different name but they're really just contracted with the the military he became apparent as the cold war dawned the limitations of that approach quickly became apparent in 1964 the service was preparing to move out of this building in the exclusive st james area of west london where it had been posing as the minimax fire extinguisher company much to the horror of the service, the current landlord started showing around prospective tenants before they'd moved out. On one day, a so-called Russian trade delegation came through, prompting frantic covering up of maps and other material. Later that year, the service moved south of the Thames and rented the newly built Century House. 
This Thomas. is how the building appeared then, but in 2001 it was refurbished and turned into residential flats. The new HQ wasn't much better. At a time when the nice existence building. of the service was still officially denied by the British government, the occupants of Century House were widely known. The Daily Telegraph even quipped that it was London's worst kept secret, known to every taxi driver, tourist guide and KGB agent. But it wasn't just the building's identity that was an issue. It had large glass windows that were perfect for snooping and a petrol station at its base, making it the perfect target for an attack. Now, before we go any further, if you want to be a top secret super spy, you'll need a good grasp of problem solving and you're more likely to pick up a pencil than an exploding pen. Luckily, there's a fun and easy way Monster. to build your skills. The best part of all, it's free to start. If Please, whatever, whatever videos I watch on whatever channel, just make sure if they have sponsors like this or advertisements, make sure to use their links and their promo codes, guys. It lets them know that they came from here and their advertisers will continue to Pay them. So if you need to decipher cryptic messages. It's really important you use the uh, promo codes. New course thinking in code. This gives you an easy step-by-step -step guide to designing computer code using visual cues. But it doesn't stop there. Brilliant has thousands of lessons which help break down complicated subjects, ranging from the fundamentals like calculus to something like data analysis, which could help you level up your career. To get started, try a free 30-day offer by visiting brilliant.org forward slash the B1M or by clicking the link in the description. The first 200 people to sign up will receive a 20% discount off their annual subscription. Each of these headquarters reflected a different part of the service's history, the clandestine offices of the embryonic service, the exclusive Broadway house that housed the service's Oxbridge graduates and minor aristocrats through World War II and the 1950s, and Century House, the dysfunctional HQ of a ramshackled organisation riddled with double agents, best summed up in John le Carre's Carl the Trilogy. By the 1980s, the building had become completely compromised. A 1985 report labelled Century House irredeemably insecure, and the hunt began for replacements. But where to go next? As the service looked for new premises, most options were ruled out because of the need to share the space with shops, restaurants or private accommodation. Any location outside London was ruled out because of the distance from other government agencies. Then, out of the blue, a solution was put forward. In 1987, Regalian Properties PLC approached the government, offering them the chance to acquire a proposed development on the south bank of the Thames. The government quickly agreed, but the intended occupants were kept top secret. I... All of the, like, double, like, uh, you get a, an, a, you go to a certain address, then that's not the real address. That's just the address you go to to get the real address. And then you go to the building. And it makes me think like, OK, so is this even the real, real building or is the super secret MI6 building just somewhere completely different? I had no idea. But the intended occupants were kept top secret. I had no idea as building MI6. I was told it was at government headquarters and we guessed wrongly very early on that it was for the Department of the Environment. The building was finished and handed over and I was watching television and on the screen the British have announced that this is the headquarters of MI6. But how do you keep a massive new spy headquarters secret from the people who are actually building it? Well, a National Audit Office report published back in 2000 shed some light on this. To avoid any future embarrassment with a landlord, the decision was quickly taken to buy the building outright for a price of £135 million. But even this nearly let the cat out of the bag. Government-funded projects are usually paid in instalments throughout construction, with each payment offering a chance for public scrutiny. Instead, the Treasury arranged for the payment to be made in full before construction started. The property developer Regalian would then design and construct the building to a standard office specification with the addition of some specialist equipment, such as emergency generators and a document lift. 
This was, remember, still the 1980s. Once the main construction phase was completed, a further £10 million was spent fitting out the building to required standards. The same project managers and construction teams were kept on to complete this, with SIS itself then coming in to complete the most secret tasks ahead of the building's opening in 1994. So, the question you've all been waiting for, what do you actually get in a top secret headquarters? Well, as you might expect, most of that is actually top secret, but here's what we do know. The building itself is a fortress. 25 different types of glass were used to meet the specific needs of this structure. Its triple glazed windows and stone exterior is bomb and bulletproof. Extra thick doors were specially designed to make the perimeter as secure as possible. Inside the complex, there's rumored to be a shooting range, ultra secure areas where eavesdropping is impossible, and a Faraday cage which blocks incoming radio waves. In a Financial Times interview, a spy said how employees are instructed to turn off all mobile phones long before they get in the building. In other words, pretty secure. But there's just one more thing. Isn't that supposed to be a secret? If hidden payments and minimal subcontractors were this triumph of clandestine bureaucracy, then failure lay in hiring one of Britain's most famous architects to design a massive building right on the River Thames. Well, by this point, change had become inevitable. As the Cold War ended and the service continued to evolve, the construction of the new headquarters was seen as an opportunity to create a new, more public face for the service. Prime Minister John Major pledged to sweep away the cobwebs of secrecy surrounding Britain's spy services. When the new headquarters was completed, it was named SISHQ, but that was actually the first time the British government had ever officially even acknowledged the existence of SIS. All the building by its actual name. We'll never know what really goes on over there in Vauxhall Cross. But what this story shows us is the power of a building to shape the organization within it. This video was sponsored by Brilliant. You can learn more about that at the link below. We're also raising awareness of construction's mental health crisis and supporting charities in this space through our Get Construction Talking initiative. There's a video series on our channel and you can find support Guys. or donate over at getconstructiontalking.org. It it's like, I know they had, uh, they brought their own people in to finish the final features in the building, but it's like, what does an environmental protection agency need a gun, uh, a gun range in their building for? <laughs> I, I, I heard, or like a noise proof, make sure that like eco terrorists don't. <laughs> And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you want to get more from the definitive video channel for construction, keep it to yourself and don't tell a soul. <laughs> Love it. Pierce Brosnan, the official, I was about to say Batman, official uh, James Bond in my eyes. All right. He's what I grew up with. Um, really cool. Hope you guys are all doing well. Would appreciate any and all comments or any questions, any answers to any questions I might have had. I'm not sure if I asked much, but really cool. All right. See you guys next video. Bye.